use of ultrafiltration. Currently, it's about ultrafiltration in patients who uh, have a large uh, volume overload, uh, uh, whether they, you know, post, uh, particularly in the patients who are uh, post-operative. Um, I'm going to start with a, a patient that uh, both uh, myself and Dr. Pascas were involved to take care of him. Uh, he's a 66 years old uh, African American male with history of mitral valve replacement. Uh, he has uh, underwent uh, about uh, a year later a, uh, a biventricular pacemaker ICD implant for a uh, uh, left ventricular ejection fracture at 35% in the setting of left bundle branch block. Uh, he presents actually with symptoms of pro progressive heart failure. Uh, was referred actually from outside hospital to Dr. Pascas to operate uh, for uh, mitral valve uh, replacement uh, in the setting of mitral stenosis. So I was called to help with a tune-up prior to mitral valve replacement. Uh, so a patient uh, basically is uh, in Anasarka, has uh, at least 60 pounds volume overload. He's been sleeping in chair for six months, and that's despite actually the, uh, uh, receiving the biomedical pacemaker for lower ejection fraction. His conversational dyspnea is confused. He's hypertensive, has a heart rate, uh, you know, stachycardic. Obviously, the, uh, the veins are distended in the neck. And that's despite actually being on a, what we call appropriate medical therapy, as listed as outpatient. He's really maxed out on lisinopril on his... Uh, cardiac anti-remodeling agents, uh, you know, carvedilol. Uh, he's taking a, a decent amount of uh, uh, diuretic, uh, and he's on statin and coumadin. And he has acute renal insufficiency uh, with more of a pre -renal like picture. Uh, the echocardiogram revealed actually that he doesn't have mitral stenosis, which is kind of hard in these patients with uh, uh, prosthetic valves. Uh, but what he does have is a severe perivalvular mitral regurgitation with the hissance of mechanical valve, of, uh, part, it's not a mechanical, it's a bioprostatic valve, I think, which is rocking. His normal ventricular systolic function uh, uh, has, uh, and the particular part of it is actually he's got severe uh, right ventricular enlargement with severe dis or right ventricular dysfunction uh, with severe pulmonary hypotension. Actually, his PA pressure was, uh, his systolic PA pressure was over 70 millimeters mercury. So. Uh, really, this is a typical patient that, uh, you know, our surgeons are not particularly fond of uh, operating. Uh, we know that you don't want to have a patient who goes uh, on pump with a uh, bad right ventricle. And, uh, you know, that's despite actually having a good left ventricle. Uh, so really the main working diagnosis was that somehow he must have a perivalvular uh, abscess of the mitral valve, that's the hissing the valve. Uh, uh, and he, uh, actually the blood cultures really grew up a clog negative staph, which wasn't clear what was causing the infection or not. And so the presumptive diagnosis was maybe the pacemaker lead, uh, uh, and there's a pacemaker lead endocarditis with subsequent perivalvular mitral valve abscess. So <clears throat> uh, I, I was called to optimize the patient, so obvious he's got bad mitral valve uh, uh, regurgitation. Uh, and uh, needs to have replaced the mitral valve, but we need to tune him up and improve his red ring of function before he can go to the operating room. Uh, we also need to obviously remove the potential source of infection, which could be the pacemaker. He was not pacemaker dependent. He, the purpose was for uh, left ventricle dysfunction. And, you know, have a mitral valve replacement and AVR replacement, aortic valve replacement, because the perivalvular abscess of the mitral valve often involves the aortic valve too. Why is the patient so sick, uh, having a relatively normal ejection fraction? The answer, volume overload is a disease. Number one, it causes renal dysfunction because the elevated right atrial pressure, especially when it reaches more than 20 millimeters mercury, leads to renal vein hypertension and renal dysfunction by reducing pressure gradient across renal vascular bed with a subsequent neurohormone activation and renal vascular constriction. Number two, it causes cardiac dysfunction. The reason is because elevated right atrial pressure and pulmonary capillary well pressure increase the afterload by uh, stretching the ventricles and uh, worsening the cardiac output. Volume overload in these patients actually it's a disease itself and it should be actually a target of therapy. And I hope I'll convince you uh, by the end of this uh, that is important. And that was the part that was neg neglected with this patient, despite of the rest of the therapies that he has received throughout. Uh, the last year. And the question is how we can treat it effectively. 
so this first slide is to show you that really all the clinical trials we have in heart failure that we show, we put, you know, we have wonderful drugs now to prevent the progression and reverse actually the, the heart failure progression uh, are actually done on patients who are stable outpatient. Uh, they are the ones who are going to benefit and these are the patients more likely will benefit from actually your medicines. If you have a patient who's actually obvious in Florida decompensate a heart failure, it's very unlikely you're going to it's going to be a patient who will benefit from any of those drugs that you put them on, even if we think we do that. Uh, so uh, typical are the patients who uh, most of the time they are volume overloaded and, you know, sure, patients when they are volume overloaded, most of the time they are in the hospital. But there are plenty of patients who actually walk around outpatient with uh, significant amounts of uh, fluid on board. And uh, I would uh, make a plea that actually those patients do not get the benefit that you expect from your medicines. Um, so we really need to have further therapy that prolongs patients' life for long-term works only the, if you have the patient cl as close as possible and most of the time to your volumic state. Uh, and the fact that the volume is an issue, it shows here that actually the higher is your intravascular volume expansive, expansion, the higher is the uh, cardiac filling pressure. And if you were to have actually volume overload, whether it's symptomatic, asymptomatic, whether it's acute or whether it's chronic, actually so, so you are more likely to die subsequently from heart failure. So these are the patients who are euvolemic. Uh, you know, three years later, they're going to be alive. Patients who are uh, not euvolemic, they're hypervolemic, they're not going to be alive. You know, half of them, one out of two are, is not going to be alive. That's independent of anything else, whether it's just for ejection fraction or anything else. Uh, and what really matters at the end is actually is truly the cardiac filling pressure. How good you are to get the patients with the heart function at the appropriate wedge. Uh, have, if you discharge the patient from the hospital with a wedge of over 16, uh, uh, really is going to be more likely the patient will be rehospitalized and will rehospitalized and will live shorter than uh, the patient who has a wedge less than 16. And that applies probably for the right side uh, heart too. And look at this, you can have a cardiac index of 1.3, uh, cardiogenic shock, or you can have a cardiac index of 2.6. That does not predict on long term what's going to happen to uh, the patient with heart failure. So the target of therapy should be actually to really, uh, uh, so volume overload really is the one that dictates the cardiac filling pressure. So if the target of uh, therapy should be to normalize the cardiac filling pressures, then we need to normalize the volume status, and, which is associated with uh, worse in hospital and outpatient outcomes in heart failure. And remember that we should really look at the cardiac filling pressures and the volume and not the cardiac output when we treat the patients, whether it's acute or chronic. Uh, and, uh, and that's been associated with uh, short and long term mortality in patients with isolated heart failure. This actually applies for sepsis too from the ICU clinical trials. But so I'm going to, uh, I would like to go over the echocardiogram of these patients because I think there are some take-home messages that we can learn from this. It doesn't matter whether you're a cardiologist or not. So notice that the levonicular function of this patient was fine. He has a bioprosthetic valve that you see how we have what we call the rocking movement. So really the mitral valve remo moves relative to the atrioventricular plane. And, and you see how it's tremendous, severe mitral regurgitation. It goes, fills pretty much the whole left atrium. And uh, not only that, but here in the apical four chamber view, notice that the right ventricle does not move. So that's really a bad sign. You know that these patients, if they go at this stage into on pump, they're very, you know, they're least likely to actually make it off the surgery, and particularly after they develop APN and everything else. And what we know, though, uh, you can have actually normal right ventricle function. Uh, if you have, uh, you, what really matter is that what's the impact of whatever is hurting the right ventricle or pulmonary hypertension increase after load onto the right ventricular cardiac filling pressures. So we often write on an echo report uh, this, uh, there is p inferior vena cava is dilated with systolic flow reverses in hepatic veins consistent with severely elevated right atrial pressure. So when we see this, that the blood is red, is basically running away from heart with the inferior vena cava is so dilated, all it means the RA pressure is over 25 and chances are this patient, no matter what's the right ventricular function, that part is not going to do well. You have to normalize that or you have to do something to really treat that. Okay, so this is what this patient had and that, remember, the right ventricular function of this patient is perfect normal. All right, so I wanted to point out that 
what causes that, uh, what that inferior vena cava dilation and elevation right atrial pressure leads to, it's an extra pathology on top of what we know. So this patient obviously has a low cardiac output uh, despite the normal ejection fraction, uh, 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 which is probably due to the extensive neurohormone activation. But on top of that, those patients who have severe elevated right atrial pressure, uh, notice that once the RA pressure goes higher than tw around 20 millimeters mercury, but 25, close to 25, you have by itself, it leads to an immediate drop in the glomerular filtration rate. In other words, elevation of right atrial pressure independent of cardiac output, it will reduce the renal perfusion, and it will, uh, uh, it will cause by itself actually renal ischemia. Okay, so this is another, and that has, you know, will, should become actual therapeutic target by itself, independent of what we're doing on the left side and on the cardiac output, okay? Uh, this actually, believe it or not, has been reported uh, uh, initially, uh, I thought in ADA, but I went back to the literature, it's been reported, this was in dogs, it's been reported actually in humans as early as late 30s, 1930s, and then again in dogs in 1947. So it's a common theme that goes back and forth in, you know, uh, in a classic actually cardiology textbook, but we kind of forgot uh, and went away from it uh, uh, since we started to practice more of a neurohormone activation. Uh, Heart failure. Uh, so what happens is, if you have a severe elevated CVP, and this actually has been studied in, a, believe it or not, in a pig model of abdominal uh, hypertension. So uh, there's a, uh, in a, uh, in a general surgeons know this, that you get uh, quite often abdominal compartment syndrome that can lead to acute renal insufficiency. That's due to the renal venous hypertension that's associated with increased intra-abdominal pressure. So this, in this model, for example, they clamp the renal vein, so we create renal vein hypertension. Uh, basically, is the equivalent of raising the renal vein pressure suddenly to 30 millimeters mercury. And that's really similar to uh, what, you know, not infrequently in our patient with right sided heart failure, we have an, a, a right atrial pressure in the 30 range. But look what happens immediately as soon as you do that. The urine output drops uh, by, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically two thirds from 1.2 uh, liters to 0.4 liters. Uh, the uh, cardiac index actually tends to do. Uh, it tends to go down, systemic vascular resistance starts to go up, and immediately the kidney is converting into a renal uh, uh, sodium retention state, starts to retain sodium, and changing the phenol towards more perennial state. And why is that? Well, it turns out the renal blood flow goes up. So you see they clamp it for 60 minutes, uh, then two hours, then they unclamp it. And immediately, as soon actually as you uh, cause renal vein hypertension, immediately the renal perfusion goes down, uh, the GFR goes down, and then as soon as you uh, release the clamp, then the, the, this is reversed. And not only that, it's not just a hemodynamic issue. This causes actually immediately a release of aldosterone, neurohormone activation, and actually a release of a renal vasoconstricting agents, such as renin, which activates the angiotensin II. The purpose of this is that will on the low, at the low dose, the angiotensin II actually will be beneficial f to improve and maintain the GFR, uh, by vasoconstricting the afferent arterial light, but then the downside of it that if you keep elevating this uh, angiotensin II and activate the catecholamines, then actually you're going to vasoconstrict the kidney and you cause actually vasoconstriction. So in these particular patients, uh, there is a severe uh, elevated right atrial pressure <laughs> due to the renal vein hyper hypertension from, uh, uh, which causes renal vein hypertension that will reduce actually the arterial pressure gradient across the renal bed and will cause, will lead to actually renal hyperperfusion, vasoconstriction, sodium and water retention, which actually will further increase on long term uh, the, uh, uh, the, will elevate the right atrial pressure and close the, this uh, negative, you know, vicious circle. And remember, actually, these patients, I think, they have dilated IVC with severe right side heart failure. Actually, they have worse neurohormone activation than the typical patients that we have just from left side heart failure. So the goal of therapy in these patients actually should be to implement measures that will reduce, by all means, the, also the right-sided pressures and improve arterial venous pressure gradient across the neurovascular bed. So, how, so uh, how can we do that? Well, the first thing we gotta do, we gotta remove the volume. You know, there, these patients will have two issues. On one hand, the volume is up, and you, and you need to remove volume to unstretch the right atrium. On the, hand, on the other hand, you have also inappropriate neurohormone activation with vasoconstriction, so you ought to use some vasodilators. So here's what happens. If we just use uh, diuretics here, typically it would be ADIV of Lasix, 
uh, and we see this all, you know, uh, all the time, actually uh, immediately the wedges start to go down, but notice what happens with the stroke volume. If you just use Lasix, actually it's gonna reduce your stroke volume in the cardiac output, and that's gonna further actually worsen the renal perfusion. Now, if you use that concomitant with a vasodilator to counteract the neurohormone activation, actually get the best of both worlds. So that's the rule number one. If you were to use diuretics, please add the vasodilator first on board, and then you use the diuretic, because <clears throat> then your renal function is gonna be worse. Now, another thing is that diuretics alone do acutely within 10 to 20 minutes. We've been taught through our, our medical school and house staff training that diuretics, IV diuretics in the patient with acutely incompensate heart failure is gonna drop your blood pressure. So you gotta be careful if you have a systolic pressure in the 90s, uh, you may wanna hold the diuretics and don't give it because it's gonna drop the blood pressure. Uh, this is far away from being truth. That will happen to me and you people who are normal because there is a media vasodilatory effect from uh, a venal dilation effect from the IV uh, loop diuretic. Really in patients with heart failure who have actually neurohormone activations, this actually hap this uh, in, uh, acute administration of loop diuretic leads to opposite. And this is a study that was done in over, <coughs> excuse me, 70 patients were admitted with acutely decompensated heart failure in Cliv at Cleveland Clinic. And notice that actually their wedge, after you give them the furosemide, goes up actually immediately. The mean arterial pressure does not go down, actually goes up. And uh, that's due to the neurohormone activation and uh, which raises actually the angiotensin level, the catecholamines, and the systemic vascular resistance. So that's why these patients, I don't treat them with diarrhea. First I prepare the field, first I give them, the, I put them board the vasodilators, and then I, and I, after I prepare, I actually add my uh, diuretic, okay? Uh, another thing that diuretics do directly to the kidney is actually they reduce by 25% the GFR which is a bad thing, and this is one of the mechanisms, and one of the, and we all know that, you know, there is no faster way of actually uh, killing somebody's kidneys by just using inappropriate and frequent uh, IV diuretics, okay? Uh, and this is a slide showing the same thing that actually the loop diuretics do, both acute and chronic actually do raise eventually, uh, cause the neurohormone activation, whether you measure it as a rain angiotensin or aldosterone. So uh, another thing that is less known uh, but it's actually well uh, published in, in, uh, in, in literature, is actually diuretics themselves can aggravate the left ventricle dysfunction on long term. As a matter of fact, in the uh, late uh, 80s, there's a study that showed that actually patients who were, were so new uh, onset heart failure, they were placed actually, uh, they were measured their neurohormone activation before actually you start them on uh, heart failure medicines, they had minimal heart failure, uh, minimal neurohormone activation, and they actually get their neurohormone activation only after we place them on diuretics. So, you know, that's the downside of the diuretics. They, not only that, if they're, they're used by themselves without blockers of neurohormone activation, you're gonna actually aggravate the EF, and then you will uh, probably uh, worsen uh, the heart failure. And uh, basically, uh, what this reproduces in short term is what we learn what we learn in long term is that it is for chronic heart failure, that direct therapy by itself causes neurohormone activation, reduces the renal blood flow, activates, causes direct resistance, but also uh, will actually uh, increase morbidity and mortality associated with heart failure. And basically, in summary, uh, uh, there, uh, we, need, we, we need to know that the good side of the diuretic is really they are able to induce a hypotonic urine temporarily reducing total body volume, which is a good thing. This is what these patients have and reduce their total body salt. The bad news activates the uh, neurohormones. They are toxic, uh, w which direct or indirect actually can reduce the cardiac output, increase system vascular resistance, and reduce the renal perfusion. And the bad news is actually long term they have been actually by themselves associated with enhanced morbidity and mortality. And a lot of times they are actually in inefficient to really reduce the edema, and we all know that. Another way of doing it, and that you know, going to the topic of the. Uh, of today's uh, uh, lecture is that actually we can try to do this with uh, ultrafiltration, remove particularly large volume of uh, fluid with ultrafiltration. That would be an alternative. And um, the in really the main indication now, so uh, is uh, a large symptomatic, what I call fluid overload, I would say at least 20 pounds in patients with acute heart failure. 
And uh, that doesn't matter whether it's, you know, related. You can have somebody with normal ejection fraction. It could be post-op. It could be uh, chronic outpatient or inpatient for whatever reason. Really, the patients may or may not have renal insufficiency. And if the patient really is a candidate for dialysis, we, this should, ultrafiltration should not replace dialysis. Actually, they should get the full benefit of dialysis. And uh, we don't do ultrafiltration on this patient. So uh, now, if the patient has renal insufficiency, <clears throat> De develop renal insufficiency during the treatment or after surgery, what I would like to do is actually to put them on ultrafiltration before you actually start to hit them with diuretics. Uh, because once you hit them with diuretics, you, uh, you consistently activate the neural hormones, and then coming with ultrafiltration after that actually will have higher risk of progression of renal insufficiency. What we need to know is that during the ultrafiltration, uh, the diuretics are stopped. Uh, we don't want to, you know, basically remove fluid from two different directions and cause, uh, uh, you know, renal dysfunction. Uh, the filter that is used for ultrafiltration actually requires intravenous heparin. Uh, it's coated with glycosaminoglycans, there for which the cells, uh, uh, the red blood cells or the white cells are very sticky. So the best anti-glycosaminoglycan actually agent that we have is heparin. Uh, and that's required. I have had a couple of patients actually who are post cabbage patients who they have HIT or suspicion of HIT, and we use successfully our gathering if we need to. Of course, this cost is going to be much higher for that. You need a central line, uh, really, uh, the quad lumen or a peripheral peak, for example. You need a less than 18 gauge uh, 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 needle or lumen because uh, the key is that you want to create a system that does not uh, uh, create obstruction through the blood flow is really a very low pressure system. You do it off the, uh, a CVP catheter, so uh, you, uh, a lot of times you can do it even on a systole pressure of 90, so you don't, it doesn't deliver the pulsatile manner. It's way better tolerated hemodynamically than the, the standard dialysis machine. Uh, the machine we have here in the hospital costs about $40,000. After that, the cost itself of using it, most of the cost goes actually into the filters, which are about $900. So. The, the, if you have a filter clogs every five minutes because, you know, we don't have a good, uh, there is some uh, blockage somewhere, then you're going to pop a filter every $900 every five minutes. So really, once we really want to basically secure that we have a nice flow, uh, flowing system, and at the same time, once it's working, uh, we can actually change it, not necessarily every 24 hours, but every 72 hours. And I had it all the way up to three days, and there's absolutely no problem with it. So now... What is the principle of ultrafiltration? So uh, really, uh, what we like to do is to remove uh, the, the, the system uses, will basic, it's an osmotic system. What it does, it's a filter that will filter the sodium out of the blood and the water will just follow. And really, maybe some small solutes like uh, the, the urea and potassium, you know, very, really potassium is actually not affected. So this does not drop the potassium. Uh, and then what we'd like to do is remove the fluid at a rate that really is going to be uh, equal or less than actually the plasma refill rate. So that's the capacity of the tissues to actually uh, put the water and the sodium back into the uh, uh, intravascular space. So how can we know that? I'm going to show you how we can monitor that on uh, our to our base. But uh, here I put this slide to show the main c comparison between the type of the fluid that you remove with the ultrafiltration machine versus the one removed with diuretics. So the, uh, the mechanical uh, removal really is an, uh, it creates an isotonic you know, filtrate it's an, with an, an isotonic urine. And what that means is that uh, there, and if we are able to, of course, to reduce the uh, volume status because we removed, uh, we, by removing volume, we re uh, reduce the intracardiac filling pressures. And basically what it does is it restores the urine natriuresis. Now the diuretic will remove more hypotonic urine. That means sure, we'll pull off a lot of sodium, but there's lots more water that goes out of the system. Now, we'll do the same thing, reducing card eventually reducing cardiac filling pressure after you pulled enough volume. The problem is that actually it reduces the urine natriuresis. So what that means is that uh, the, the, uh, as soon as you have removed more hypotonic urine, you're going to have actually tremendous tendency of the kidney to retain the sodium and not cause and not have further natriuresis. So a lot of patients who get initial diuretics well, after you stop them or between the break, they actually have tremendous increased reabsorption of the sodium and the water. And so that's why they're so easy actually to 
accumulate back the, you know, the fluid in the system. Well, with uh, ultrafiltration, after you remove the fluid, because you don't have the, this rebound sodium retention, you're actually more likely the patient will stay euvolumic for long, uh, long term, uh, even outside of the hospital. Uh, so the keys, uh, the principle is that well, we, before we start ultrafiltration, I think it's good to estimate the amount of volume that we need to do, we to need, need to remove. Really, you, you got to be careful because this system can pull off anywhere between zero to f up to 500 ml an hour of UF, uh, of uh, fluid. So uh, I had, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I had a patient that I used up to 450 ml an hour who had tremendous volume overload, and you can pull all the way up to 12 liters. Now, if you put that and you put it on continuous, you know, going before you go home, you make sure that you do have that volume in the patient's body, be you know, before you, you do it. Then the second is, uh, the rate of removal really is purely dictated of what's the capacity of the patient to reabsorb the water back into the intravascular space. If the main problem is that most of the edema is actually in the uh, its peripheral, so you know, in the legs, in the lower extremities, on the abdomen, then actually that capacity is quite high. I can tell you can go all the way up. It's probably some estimates you can go all the way up to a liter if we need an hour. Now, if this is a lot of fluid, it's in the uh, pleural space or it's in ascites, in peritoneal uh, space. And then actually you're limited by peritoneal pleural reabsorption capacity. That's much lower. So you really got to go much lower with those patients. Now, another thing that's important, remember that you need full anticoagulation uh, to preserve the filter function. And really, if something happens in the filter class, the good news as opposed to dialysis machines that you're going to lose about 300 ml. With this one, you only lose about 40 ml of, of, the, of the blood. So these particular patients actually I decided from the beginning to put him on ultrafiltration. We actually, I estimate I have about uh, 80 pounds to remove from him. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, he had about 115 kilos on admission. Uh, after five days, really, we dropped a good, uh, oh, oh, you know, uh, close to 20 kilos. Uh, and uh, here what you see is actually the, the BUN uh, plotted against time. Uh, and notice that although it was elevated initially after uh, some tendency to go up, eventually after stopping the uh, ultrafiltration, which was stopping then six, uh, actually the BNN creatinine normalized a few days later. Uh, the urine output actually has increased. This you've got to multiply by 100. Uh, and that's because you improve all the, you know, renal hemodynamics and the creatinine has normalized too. Most of the time we use two to 300 mLs an hour, which will remove anywhere between 4.8 to 7.2 liters a day. Uh, what you need to do from the nurse standpoint is that you need to monitor the color of the, so this is the machine, you have an input you know, circuit, an output circuit that goes into uh, your quad lumen, and then uh, really this is the ultrafiltration bag that after it fills up to a liter then it's empty and then you know, it keeps draining there. So look at the monitor, the, the, the bag itself, make sure that that should be always clear, the liquid. If it gets, you know, pink stain or blood stain, that means the filter broke, you gotta change it, you no, long, you no longer have a sterile circuit. The second thing from nurse standpoint, what we need to do is to have somehow, if we could have somehow a handle of what's the, uh, uh, you know, how can we pull off, you know, we can pull off uh, the fluid at the rate that actually the body can put it back in the intravascular space. And a lot of, believe it or not, our, uh, our ultrafiltration form says, call MD if the blood pressure is less than 90, heart rate is more than 100. And I will tell you that if you wait until that happens and you keep pulling off fluid, it's already too late, okay? You already cause your renal insufficiency, like it happened very often. Really, the first thing that happens is actually get renal hyperperfusion. And for us, the day to day and hour to hour, the best way to monitor our to our renal perfusion is actually to look at the urine output, okay? And we know that. So for me, hourly urine output is the instant, reflects the instantaneous renal perfusion. And I always give actually a guideline that if the, the urine output drops to less than 50% that what well, it was before we started the ultrafiltration, or if it's an absolute number that's less than 30 ml an hour, I need to know so I can reduce my ultrafiltration rate and, you know, so uh, uh, slow down. So, uh, and remember, don't wait until uh, the blood pressure and the heart rate changes because it's already too late, okay? So this patient actually a total of 80 pounds were removed in five days, uh, BN and creatinine normalized in nine, nine days, 
And uh, we removed the BIVICD, and on day 15, I actually went for a major valve replacement, an ART valve replacement. And actually, the patient felt so good, he was able to lie flat, he didn't know why he needs the surgery. So this speaks for the fact that his disease was actually the volume overloaded. By the way, his PA pressure normalized after that, too. So a lot of this pulmonary hypertension in this setting is related to just pure volume overloading. You cannot really know what's the, the, what's the real uh, PA pressure until you normalize that. So I actually went to Wesley, home, uh, Wesley Woods for, you know, for 10 days and then eventually was discharged home. And he was outpatient for a year and a half. Uh, this is, I wanted to show you the effect of how important is this uh, you know, stretch of the right side uh, on this patient. So we have a post-op uh, uh, new bioprosthetic valve here, an aortic valve here. And I would like for you to look at the right ventricle. I don't know if you can appreciate that it's way, it's way more dynamic and moving. So a lot of these right ventricles, actually, they can come back if we do the proper uh, treatment. And in his inferior vena cava also normalized in terms of size, that there was no more red flow here than pathophugal flow. So um, I wanted to, so the take home message is this, that large re volume removal can be achieved fast by combining ultrafiltration and appropriate use of diuretics or vasodilators. Uh, you can, uh, this actually re result in dramatic improvement on patient clinical condition and adequate preparation for surgery. And the right ventricle function, a lot of times, it's a dynamic thing that can actually, they're very resilient. So it's bad when they are bad, but actually a lot of time, a lot of times if you treat appropriate whatever is causing it, actually it can, they can improve. Uh, and sometimes quite uh, quick. There is only one study, so ultrafiltration used for heart failure it's been, uh, the concept of ultrafiltration has been out for at least 20 years, but really only there, uh, there, there's a newer machine that made it actually simple to be used both by our nurses and by our doctors and safe. And there's one randomized large, larger trial that came out last year in, in Jack that randomized 200 patients with volume overload in the setting of acute heart failure to either diuretics or uh, ultrafiltration, and really the primary endpoints was weight loss and this met 48 hours. It wasn't, you know, the number was not high enough to look at mortality type data. And what I like about this trial is that actually there were patients where half of them were class four heart failure, and there they already had some kind of renal insufficiency, which speaks by itself that these were quite sick patients. Uh, and bottom line is that really with ultrafiltration uh, during the first two days of admission, they were able to remove uh, an average about one and a half liters more with the ultrafiltration compared to uh, uh, the diuretics alone. And really, there was no major change between the other scores, like this NAS score, where there was no major change in terms of the renal insufficiency compared to diuretics. What we did change, though, was uh, the actually, they followed the patients up to 90 days. And actually, that reduced uh, uh, the risk of rehospitalization and uh, number of, uh, you know, uh, of days of rehospitalization or visits to emergency room uh, by about, you know, 25 percent. So at the end, really, uh, what was not and was, came to a little surprise was the fact that although you deliver therapy in the hospital, actually protects you from being, re, you know, readmitted in the hospital up to, you know, 90 days there. And uh, basically, uh, use of ultrafiltration during the index hospitalization associated with about 53 percent reduction in the risk of rehospitalization of heart rate for heart failure. For me, I would say this, this was not necessary, the benefit of the using the machine itself. What it is is that we remove a liter and a half extra fluid. Chances are we treated, we got the patient closer to euvolemic state. So uh, the conclusion is that more aggressive fluid removal with ultrafiltration will actually lead to fewer rehospitalization in, in the first 90 days and so makes a case for us to be as aggressive as we can to normalize the volume status of the patient. And ultrafiltration in sm some smaller studies has shown that actually not only in chronically may reduce the rehospitalization, but acutely actually because you unload the heart by reducing the intercardiac filling pressures, you can actually increase the stroke volume, therefore the cardiac output, you reduce the right atrial pressure and you reduce the uh, uh, wedge pressure. In conclusion, ultrafiltration improves cardiac function by reducing the cardiac filling pressures, reducing the afterloaded ventricles, and increasing cardiac output. And, and you know, when you compare that with furosemide, although we get an initial beneficial effect with your furosemide, actually with time, the, uh, the, a lot of times these patients actually fluid, they remember the diuretics themselves will create more when enhance the sodium and water retention state. So actually a lot of times we have about 25% of the patients will leave the hospital actually with the body weight and fluid accumulation is worse than to begin with, while the UF effect appears to be uh, persistent.
Therefore, in contrast to diuretics, ultrafiltration does not appear to cause rebound sodium retention. In summary, ultrafiltration is indicated in patients with refractory heart failure with over 20 pounds volume overload in which diuretics are ineffective in removing the fluid. In general, these patients have severely elevated cardiac filling pressures, both right and left side, and large volume overload associated with cardiorenal syndrome. Be happy to take some questions if there are any. All right, thank you. Obvious, this is not neurosurgery. So. I was almost in time. We do it only in CCU, really in 41 CCU and in 21 ICU. Uh, the risk of it is relates to uh, the insertion of the, you know, of the quad lumen, the need for heparin for blood thinners during the procedure. Uh, and, uh, you know, one could say, well, why don't you do it for eight hours and jack it up at 500 cc so you can read four liters in eight hours? Really, the rate, it's important. I mean, you got to monitor your urine output. You got to put a foley in them, at least according for, to you know, the way I'm doing it to be safe from the kidney standpoint. Probably you can say, well, let's remove just two or four liters uh, you know, in a day. You could do that. I just don't know whether it's going to justify the cost. I think the key is here for a given patient is not to remove, you know, if I were to remove 10 pounds and somebody's got 80 pounds, I'm not going to do anything for him. So I, I uh, and if he only needs to remove 10 pounds, probably can do that with diuretics. So, I mean, that could be a possibility, but you have to have a whole system there. The company says that, that you can do it through a pick line. I have not tried it because even when we are doing with triple lumen, it's way more shorter, less resistance. We clog the filter so often uh, just because there is resistance to the system that, you know, it was, I don't think it's cost effective. You know, what we had at the beginning a uh, patient that in 24 hours we changed five filters, so that was 4,000, you know, you know, a lot of money. So, of course, company wants us to use the filters, but I, I, I think we're going to stick with, uh, we'll try to make it cost effective, so.